for people who may not have heard of uh, Amra Shabik Al Rais, um, she uh, she is actually a genocide survivor. She is a Bosnian Muslim, and uh, uh, she is a genocide survivor. In fact, we are here to listen to her side of the story. And in fact, it's a first-hand, uh, first-hand account of what of what we were what you're going to hear. So she actually grew up in a place wow. called uh, Bihak. I don't know if you're pronouncing it correctly, in Bosnia. Um, after surviving ethnic cleansing and more than 1,100 days under the Serbs military siege, she emigrated to the USA in 1996. By 1999, December, she earned a BA in economics from Brown University. Later, she obtained two master's degrees and a doctorate from Columbia University. Currently, in fact, she's there at the Columbia now. She's a professor there, working on uh, understanding how and why societies fall apart and what role education can play in rebuilding decimated countries. She has published extensively on education-related issues and has lectured around the world to adult and adolescent audiences. In her students' feedback, Ambra is consistently praised as one of the most inspiring professors they have encountered. She divides her time between Manhattan and Taxedo Park with her husband and two daughters, aged 11 and 13. So that's a very uh, brief biography of uh, Ambra. And this book, which she has authored, is called The Cat That I Never Named. We have also given this book in our uh, um, invitation poster. There's also a link to that in our invitation poster to purchase that. And I think it's worth purchasing. This, must, this is a wonderful account. Though I have not read it fully, but um, uh, I, I definitely would recommend it to people who are listening to us now. And um, as we know, today terrorism is a big issue across the world. And um, we stem basically from our ideology also. But at the same time, we also know uh, that one of the biggest reasons for terrorism is also Islamophobia and the attacks on Islam. They, they both Islamophobia and uh, Muslim radicalism enjoy kind of a symbiotic relationship. We both feed on each other. So, and this is exactly what uh, uh, Amra also feels. Uh, she's going to discuss how Islamophobia fuels radicalism and then it's a vicious circle. Um, so therefore, I, I, I thought I, I would uh, like to, uh, I think without much taking uh, taking much of your time, I'd like to now invite um, Amra to uh, give us a uh, brief reading. I think, I think this, we have sectioned it this way. She's going to read from the book and then discuss a bit with the audience before formally opening it up for the Q&A. Uh, I think this is going to be for one hour and the Q&A will be for another hour. Over to you, Amra. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Faiz, for that um, lovely introduction. I am uh, truly grateful to be here and I am just going to share some of the slides that I have pre prepared for you today. Yes. Yes. Um, well, you, you um, can... <laughs> I think you can see it now. If you just show me thumbs up. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yes, you can see um, it, yes. Wonderful. So I'm gonna talk about, um, as uh, Faiz has shared, um, this relationship between Islamophobia, radicalization, not only radicalization um, uh, that uh, consequently happens amongst Muslims, but also radicalization within other groups. And I will do that by really sharing with you some of my story and the background of what had happened during the Bosnian uh, genocide. And as you can see here in the photo, and I'm gonna read in a couple of minutes from my book, The Cat I Never Named, a particular scene that will link us to some of the theories that I have on how radical really emerges. Um, so the, the scene that I will be reading um, actually in many ways relates at least to the experience of many kids in the United States today, which I think has helped uh, make, uh, make this book very interesting at this particular moment, because um, during the war, I didn't have normal access, access to schooling, as many kids today around the world don't have normal schooling um, as well. So there are many connective uh, points that create this connective tissue between the story I tell in The Cat I Never Named and the experiences of some of the kids um, around the world um, today who also may be feeling excluded, not necessarily because they're Muslim, but perhaps because they're Black or uh, belong to a particular race or group 
um, ethnic or religious that is marginalized in their rele relevant society. So after I read that scene, I will connect that scene to what I call educational di displacement and replacement theory of radicalization, which is my view that radicalization <laughs> begins with the exclusion in the educational system that happens in different forms around the world. Now, uh, before I go into reading, I want to give you a sense of uh, background of where I come from. I know Faiz has mentioned to me in our one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation that a lot of people in, the, in India might not be aware of what had happened in former Yugoslavia. Um, former Yugoslavia was a country, as you can see in this map, right across Italy, um, in the Balkans and Eastern Europe, uh, that formed during World War II. It was a federation. It was a federation of six republics, and you can see them here in bright colors, um, Slovenia in blue, yellow, Croatia, then my country that I was born in, Bosnia and Herzegovina, then Serbia in pink, Montenegro in purple, Macedonia in orange. And then there were two autonomous regions called Kosovo and Vojvodina. And in this uh, federation, really the most powerful uh, republic, as it was called at the time, or the most powerful state was Serbia. And we'll see the significance of that in the next couple of slides. So I was born a Bosnian Muslim or Bosnia, uh, belonging to an ethnic group of Bosniaks that has existed in this region for hundreds of years. That also meant that I was born hated in the context of Yugoslavia that was dominated by Serbia's politics. Uh, Serbia uh, was a populist uh, state that, as I mentioned, controlled the politics, controlled military. More than 90% of the officers in the army, in the Yugoslav National Army, were Serbs. So de facto, um, Yugoslavia was a place where Serbia really um, decided on what was even taught in schools. So as a Muslim kid, I never read a story, a single story that had a Muslim character in it. I also, I was a complete math and physics nerd. Ultimately, that's how I got to the United States. I won some national math and physics competitions, uh, but I never once solved a math problem that had a Muslim character um, a Muslim name um, in it. Uh, we were not legally allowed to say that we were Bosniaks. It was only in 1961 that we were allowed on census to say that we were Muslim. And that was also um, outlawed prior to 1961. And so um, all the way up to the actual onset of genocide, we were not in any formal legal context permitted to say that we were Bosniaks. Um, by mid-1980s, a leader emerged in the Republic of Serbia. His name was Slobodan Milosevic. He um, wanted to dominate beyond the dominance that Serbia already had in terms of military, politics, economy. Milosevic was really an authoritarian. He uh, began to build his power on this narrative of hate and Islamophobia. And Muslims suddenly were portrayed as terrorists, uh, as invaders. We were um, uh, portrayed as having unclean blood, uh, the term of blood and uh, um, our impurity became prevalent in Serbia's propaganda. Um, we were essentially impediments to this idea of pure white Christian Europe. And so over a couple of years, I would say from mid 1980s until early 1990s, Milosevic actually through dominance in media um, radicalized Serbs in the same way that white supremacists uh, um, are radicalized today in the United States. So they de facto uh, became believers in this idea that Muslims had to be eradicated that we were a danger to purity of, of, of in Europe. And so in fear of Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, which by early 1990s uh, were terrified of what Milosevic might do um, to these, uh, in, uh, these states, they proclaimed independence. So Bosnia and Herzegovina was recognized as an independent country 
um, in 1990s. In fact, uh, um, <clears throat> independence is celebrated tomorrow on March 1st. March 1st, 1992 is when we proclaimed independence. That triggered the war because uh, Milosevic, again, Serbia, as you can see in pink here on the map, um, they um, controlled the military. Um, so they essentially took control over the entire military in what was once Yugoslavia and started the bloodshed. Bloodshed was particularly gruesome in Bosnia because vast majority of Bosnians were Muslims. By 1999, Milosevic was, or is, was indicted by the UN's International Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He was indicted for genocide, for deportation, for murder, for persecution on political, racial, and religious grounds, for extermination, torture, and many other accounts, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Kosovo, where another war followed, and uh, Croatia. He was nicknamed the Butcher of the Balkans, but he unfortunately died before the trial ended. Um, despite uh, the fact that he died before he was, um, uh, uh, before the decision by the court was made, he is uh, thought of as really the leader of this radicalization amongst the Serbs that led to ultimately ethnic cleansing and genocide of Bosnian Muslims in Bosnia. And this is just to give you, a, this map gives you a snapshot of uh, sort of territorial dominance of Serbs because of their military dominance. Uh, Bosnian Muslims had no weapons. In fact, um, there was weapons embargo uh, instituted by the UN um, uh, uh, and the international community in hope that having weapons embargo would lessen the atrocities. However, what actually uh, weapons embargo did is that this it disallowed Muslims from arming themselves and defending ourselves given that the international community was not doing anything to stop the genocide. Um, Serb Serbia already had all the weapons that they wanted um, and so they easily ethnically cleansed and killed Muslims. All the red areas in former Yugoslavia are the areas that Serbia um, essentially took over, uh, prosecuted, killed uh, those who were non-Serbs. Serbs are just as a background, they're Orthodox Christian. And so they were not only killing Muslims, they were also killing Catholics um, and Catholics in the context of former Yugoslavia, mostly reside in Croatia. And um, the green areas that you see in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is the tri triangle in the middle, are the areas where Muslim population that was able to escape persecution concentrated. And I personally lived in uh, my hometown of Bihać. In fact, you can see here this green um, pocket really that existed in the northern western part of Bosnia um, that was surrounded by Serb military from all the sides. So we had no access to the outside world for several years as a result of that. This is just a photo of Bihać of my city uh, to give you a sense that it's actually a beautiful region of the world. Um, this is um, this is one of uh, one of its uh, rivers, uh, one of the rivers in Bosnia called Una, named by Romans as one and only one because of its beauty. And in fact, I share this photo with you because the scene I will be reading from my book occurs on this very bridge. That was one of the targets by the Serbs during the war. So I was born, raised in Bosnia, um, and genocide lasted from 1992 to till the end of 1995. I spent that entire time <clears throat> in my besieged city of Bihać. Um, genocide was committed by Serbs from Serbia, but also helped by Serbs from Bosnia. Um, as a Bosnian Muslim, I, along with others, stood in in, in the way of the racial priority as defined by Serbia. My uh, family members in France were slaughtered, many tortured, some raped. My house was bombed, my family was injured. We starved um, essentially for nearly four years. Um, I left Bosnia as a genocide survivor in early 1996. I came to the United States on a scholarship. This is one of the photos 
of me returning to Bosnia. This is uh, this was taken after the war. In fact, in '97, um, just to give you a sense of the destruction and the extent of it. This is another uh, neighborhood totally destroyed. This is a photo uh, that broke the news to the world, to the Western world, that there was genocide occurring in Bosnia. This is a photo from a concentration camp. Um, uh, we had concentration camps throughout um, uh, Bosnia. Serbs established the, also rape camps for Bosnian Muslim women and uh, Bosnian uh, Muslim men were starved uh, and many executed. I do have a couple of friends who survived concentration camps and today live um, around the world. I wanted to share one example during the Bosnian genocide um, uh, that occurred specifically in the town of Srebrenica. In fact, you can watch a movie that will give you a better sense of what had happened called Quo Vadish Aida. If you, just, if you just Google and search for a list of movies nominated this year for Oscars, it is a movie that is on the list of nominated uh, uh, productions. It is very powerful and tells the story of what happened in the town of Srebrenica, which was like my city, one of uh, five towns in Bosnia that the UN said they would protect. They called us safe areas. In this photo, in the middle, you see a smiling Serb general who uh, basically has entered uh, the city of Srebrenica. The UN allowed them to enter the city. In the city at the time were only uh, Muslim civilians um, and uh, Serbs, um, in essence, executed vast majority of the population, uh, mostly men and boys. Some women were able <coughs> to escape. Um, this is another photo of um, these uh, Muslim civilians trying to seek protection from the UN, as was said, uh, would occur, the protection didn't happen, um, and the UN essentially watched um, this genocide unfold. Uh, this is simply another um, uh, photo uh, of some of those who tried to escape, um, and many of them didn't make it, but some uh, have. This is a photo of a doll. For me, this is one of the most po powerful images. Why? This is actually a doll left on a mass grave as a threat to the survivors who were coming back to seek the bodies of those who were killed. So the hatred and Islamophobia that existed during the war continues to be per perpetuated and genocide, in fact, denied despite all of the um, uh, evidence that shows that genocide did occur. This is one of the photos that Time magazine named as one of the uh, 100 most powerful photos of the 20th century. This is an example of Serb soldiers who enter, enter the Bosnian city and uh, went through um, homes and the streets executing Bosnian Muslims. Um, uh, but you can see that even after killing this particular uh, family, uh, the Serb soldier continues to beat Muslims as a reflection of how deep um, this hatred was. This is another photo uh, of excavations from the mass graves, which continue 25 years after the war, we continue to discover new mass graves. Um, Serbs engaged in the practice of digging the mass graves, taking the bodies and reallocating them into an, uh, other regions to try to hide the extent of the killings and atrocities. Now that I've given you quickly some <clears throat> background on this, what's often seen as a complicated history, to me, it is not complicated. It is very simple. It is a result of Islamophobia um, and targeting of Muslims in, in former Yugoslavia. Uh, but now that I've given you this background, I would like to take um, a few minutes to read from the cat I never named, a particular scene that will then take us into some of the conversation and my sort of theoretical perspective on how radicalization can, um, can happen. So as I said, this is a scene where um, I find myself on a bridge in my hometown of Bihać. Um, this is a moment when I find out during the war um, and I was only 16 when the war started, so I was a young girl. 
Um, I find out that the school is going to be back in session. We often didn't have school because Serbs would bomb schools with the intent to kill young um, generations. And so we had to, um, in fact, hide when the school was um, uh, happening. We would have school for a couple of days. And then if the bombing intensified, we would, um, uh, we would stop. And so this is, as the war begins, this is the first time months into the war that I hear school is um, opening and I decide without telling my parents to leave my, because I knew they, they would be unlikely to allow me to, to leave the home. Um, I cross this main bridge to go to another part of the city to tell a friend of mine that um, school is happening. Then I hear whistling overhead, a thin reedy sound. An instant later, I see a flash as a missile hits a house on the bank of the Una, on my home side of the bridge. The sound of the explosion comes an instant later, and I stand frozen, bizarrely thinking about physics, about the relative speed of light and sound that cleaves the experience in two. First, the sight of fire and flame, then disconnected by a second or, or two, sound waves that roll over me like messengers eager to bear bad news. I hear another missile overhead launched from the mountains surrounding our town. Someone told Tata, who told me in turn, the bomb that you hear is not the one with your name on it. If you hear it whistle, it is because it's flying over your head to somewhere else. You never hear a whisper from the bomb that kills you. The air raid siren starts its high pitched howl then. We have no radar, nothing to tell us that missiles are inbound. So the siren is a joke. It just serves to remind us that people are being killed. It gives no warning, just wails and mourns with the rest of us. Davor and I find each other again. We're still frozen in place, not knowing if we're about to die, but our eyes meet across the bridge. Between us, I see the mother and her little boy, the girl in the green sweater, a trio of middle-aged women who look like sisters. Davor takes a step towards me. Then the air seems to be sucked out of the world as I'm hit with an earth-shattering, deafening explosion. There's a flash between Davor and me and I'm blinded. Metal and stone are flying around me. I turn to run. And it's only when my legs are moving that I realize I'm not dead. I only make it a few steps before I fall, scraping my knees. In the dust and chaos, I hear screams and I drag myself to my feet, stunned. My ears are ringing and the air is choked with dust. I smell smoke, I taste smoke. There's grit on my tongue. The blue bridge is still standing. The bomb struck a glancing blow that didn't do anything much to the structure, but the pedestrians on the bridge. Against every survival instinct, I make myself walk back towards the other end of the bridge. I look all around, but don't see Davor. The little boy, the one who wanted to look at fish over the side of the bridge is standing in the middle of a cloud of masonry dust. His mouth is open. And at first I think the sound he's making is part of the loud ringing in my ears because everything sounds weirdly muffled at first. The sounds are returning to my ears one at a time. Then I realize he's screaming, a long drawn out terrible cry that stops only when he's out of breath then starts again after a ragged gasp. I go to him. He's blonde, tussle haired and blue eyed just like Dino when he was younger. But his little face looks impossibly old. I wish he could be confused. I wish he didn't know exactly what just happened. But this little boy understands his loss and he's suffused with helpless inarticulate rage. I go to him, reaching out my hand. He just stares at me with his prematurely aged face. I look beyond him, blood on a stylish suit, the fox fur collar, 
made from a whole fox, its sharp white teeth grinning as it grasps its own tail. Its black glass eyes are staring at me. Above that, nothing. There's nothing where his mother's head should be. He finds words now and his screams turn into a desperate wail for his mother. He's not looking at her, but he must have seen. He's calling to her like his words could turn back time, undo the bomb, like if he begs the universe loudly enough, he can make his mother alive again. I take his little hand and he looks at me like I'm an alien thing. I try to lead him off the bridge, but he's like a boulder, immovable. All this time, he never stops screaming his feral fury against the world. An old man staggers behind, beside us. A couple clings to each other as they walk through the smoke. Though it's midday, the smoke and dust make it look like a foggy evening. Survivors are like ghosts in the haze. I still don't see Davor, not among the bodies or the survivors. The little boy's grief shatters me. There's nothing I can do, so I leave him. It's a wrenching decision, but someone will come to help him. I look at the other people on the bridge. The three middle-aged sisters are strewn about like old clothes. That is what I see, their old lady sweaters and their sensible shoes. A man is hanging half of the bridge, draped over the rail. Blood is dripping in a puddle at his feet. Then I see the girl in the green sweater like mine. She's on the ground, curled on the side, facing away from me. Her sweater is perfectly clean and tidy, like she just decided to take a nap in this odd place. I think she's unconscious. Maybe she was knocked out by the shock wave. I kneel at her side and take her shoulder, gently turning her over as I say, don't worry, I'm here, I'll help you. I roll her and find a bloody horror. The front of her body is stripped of clothes, stripped of skin, shredded from a hail of metal and stone sharpener. From the front, she doesn't look human. She looks like meat. I scream and scramble backward on my hands and, and feet like a crab, wiping my bloody hands on the ground. They make a red paste with the dust. I roll to my knees, hold myself to my feet, look around for somebody, anybody who can do something. Suddenly there are lights up ahead in the middle of the road where we're walking. It's a big square white lorry with tall blue letters on the side, UN. The United Nations is supposed to be here to help the suffering to facilitate peace. With a gasp of, re of relief, I run to meet the truck, waving my hand to stop them. Help is here, I shout to the little boy as I pass him. These men will help you. I'm standing in the middle of the road, right in the truck's path. It slows. The driver sees me. He meets my eye. Please have medics, I think. Please have some kind counselor who can take care of this poor child. Please have someone to compassionately tend to that poor girl's body to cover her ravaged face. But the UN truck swerves around me, increasing speed. Okay, I think they're going to the wounded in the center of the bridge. But the truck doesn't stop. It drives fast enough to make the damaged bridge shake. It swerves carefully around the carnage and rubble and carries on as if dead Bosnians weren't sprawled on the street. The world is watching and it doesn't care. Thank you. Um, the reason why I read this piece, which is not easy for me to read is because it is one of the important moments in my life. Um, and I really wanted to ask you, um, all of you who are on, on, on this call today, um, to um, really to respond to one question, which is why do you think I shared this particular scene with you in the context of our conversation today about Islamophobia, <clears throat> about radicalization? Why this particular scene? Anyone? Yeah, yeah participants can unmute and ask, please. 
an answer. Please go ahead. Yeah, please feel free to unmute and ask. I mean, unmute and respond to the question. I think that's a very important question. Uh, can, the, uh, can the question yes. be repeated again, please? Yeah, it's on the screen. It's on the screen. Yeah. It's on the screen, and the question is, why do you think in the context of our conversation today about Islamophobia, radicalization, genocide, why did I share this particular scene with you? Why is this scene important? In your view, there's no right or wrong answer. Why do you think yeah. this? I read this thing. Yes, uh, my name is Irfan. First of all, I uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I, I cannot, uh, when you were reading from your book, I'm really, really uh, into such shock that how human can go to the level and that extent of uh, genocide. And I really, really. Uh, acknowledge your braveness and the difficulty which you have gone through and the other people. I'm really sorry for that. And uh, to, to the question, what I can tell you uh, is that uh, why do you think I shared this particular scene with you? I believe that you don't want Muslims to radicalize and do the same thing what Serbs have done due to their hatred toward Muslims. This I am saying on behalf of one more uh, thing which I have heard from one of my colleagues in uh, Greece. Whenever we were sitting together, the only uh, point which came into discussion about Muslim was how Turk invaded Greece and destroyed them. So that hatred and towards the Turks or Turkey were always there. So what I think, when you are telling this story, you are mentioning the problem, what uh, you have gone through, or the Muslim as a whole in Bosnia uh, area have gone through, but you don't want us to be radicalized and have that phobia towards the Serb, or meaning the other side uh, of the one who do this kind of adversity. This is what I try and I'm, I'm thinking of what you are trying to pass on the message. Thank you. Thank you, Irfan, very much for your for your response and your kind words at the beginning. Um, you are precisely right. That is absolutely one of the reasons I wanted to share this particular powerful moment. Um, um, this is a moment that can change people. Um, this scene really reflects a type of experience that can change how we see the world, right? I was a young woman who um, suddenly, and as you see on, this, uh, on the bridge, there's a young boy whose mother's um, um, head is essentially blown up. Um, and uh, we were young individuals who could have easily, out of anger for what had been done to us, responded um, in a very different way. And I see somebody else is raising their hand. So I'm gonna, is it Raju, yeah. Rajula? So go ahead, Rajula. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Yes. Uh, it really makes us weep inside our hearts to hear your heartbreaking story. Uh, we, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's enlightening. And uh, my question is, and this is applies really in general to everybody where Muslims are in minority, that what the, I mean, two things. One, do you think Bosnian Muslims uh, bear some responsibility for it? And number two, related, what the Muslim community uh, in Bosnia or in, in general in Yugoslavia could have done differently uh, that could have helped prevent or at least prevent the, the type of torture and, and uh, extermination that uh, followed. 
That's an excellent question. Um, and, and I'm going to link it to, to what Muslims might be able to do elsewhere today. There's really nothing that we could have done as Muslims in former Yugoslavia because we lived in a dictatorship. We lived in a, um, in a country where uh, we really had no voice. Um, one um, effort uh, that I always believe in and that many Muslims in Bosnia at the time pursued was to be as successful in the educational system as possible. So even though the system discriminated against us, even though we were invisible and not present, uh, represented, even though as a little girl, I was aware of that without anyone explicitly saying it to me, uh, because I've never seen a name Amra on paper in school. Um, but I, my form of resistance was to achieve educationally and uh, learn and, and rise to the top in a way that couldn't be disputed based on merit, <clears throat> and that's what I did. Um, and I do think that um, unfortunately what happened, many who were part of, I will say, Muslim intel intelligentsia uh, in Bosnia and former Yugoslavia, uh, because of that education, we actually, by early 1990s, we became um, a threat because once you are highly educated and you have competences and skills, you begin to enter certain positions in society that um, those who dominated don't, don't want to share. Um, and that was really ultimately the trigger for, for the genocide. Uh, we couldn't do uh, much to prevent it because we didn't, we were not in military. We uh, were not holding positions of officers in the military who were uh, making decisions. We um, didn't have um, a power over media. Uh, there was no freedom of media in dictatorship. So when Milosevic took control, he essentially uh, fictionalized these narratives. And so he would say that people like, me, who were Muslim, who were Bosnian Muslims, that we were throwing Serb, children's, uh, Serb children into Sarajevo Zoo to animals. This is established fact. These stories were created, existed, um, uh, had nothing to do with um, the truth, but it didn't matter because he controlled media and he controlled through media and education he controlled the narrative that was produced. And so if you repeat lies enough times, they become perceived as truism, they become a perceived reality. And I think one could connect, um, for instance, that challenge and struggle in the United States today with uh, the last couple of years of uh, uh, Trump administration and the struggle that uh, has been pursued in America over what is truth, what is reality, what is fact, what is fiction. And we can see how even in a democratic society, people really can be compelled to buy into these narratives of othering and, and hatred. So um, what I think I couldn't do growing up in former Yugoslavia, I am trying to do now as a genocide survivor. It's certainly not easy for me to read the segment from the book. It is not easy for me to be talking about genocide. I am targeted sometimes by white supremacists who still believe I'm a form of ethnic or racial impurity um, because of my Muslim background. But I do think it's very important to educate using these historical examples so that we can, in hope of preventing radicalization uh, uh, amongst Muslims and radicalization really within any group because these narratives of hate are effective tools to radicalize uh, within, within any group, not, not, not only Muslims, not, um, uh, not only Serbs, uh, no one is immunized against hatred. And so we have to be very vigilant about that. And that is my role in the context of education today. I'm going to just ask if anyone else has any other questions before we go on. Okay. Um, so, so, so to go back to this scene that I read um, and shared with you, the reason I, I share that moment is uh, really because it can be life-changing. Um, it can 
distort um, who I was uh, prior to the war. It certainly led to uh, deconstructing my own entire worldview. Uh, this expectation that the UN was there to protect, that the world would stop genocide, that killing wouldn't be allowed, and that all of that was permissible. And it was all permissible simply because of my identity. And so then the question becomes, how does one respond, which is, I think, the, the first person who uh, who commented is precisely the reason why I, I, I wrote this book is how do we now respond? We know the genocide happened. We know Muslims are discriminated against, uh, were discriminated against in Bosnia. We know that this um, Islamophobia continues to happen around the world. But the question is, what do we do about it? Do Is the violent solution or perhaps are there other alternatives? And of course, as you can see, based on my story and my the work I do, I'm a firm believer that under no circumstances is violence an option, that education is always the right, uh, the right uh, course of action. Um, I also wanted to share with you that this, this kind of crisis or experience triggers what we call in education transformative learning. And that transformative learning doesn't only happen for those who survive it. So it doesn't only change who I am as a genocide survivor, but it also can referentially impact others. And this is where uh, one of you said, uh, my, I feel in my heart pain for what had happened to you. That emotional connection, that referential co connection uh, with other communities is very important. Often we know that through intergenerational trauma, survivors, um, uh, children of survivors are affected by uh, genocide or by trauma. And so we know that, uh, for instance, my own children, even if I choose not to talk about my experiences, will be affected by the way I think, by the way I behave as a parent who has gone through genocide. Other Muslim communities will be affected. And we know that Bosnian genocide has been one of the narratives or stories used in the West by the extremist organizations who are trying to recruit young Muslims as the reason why violence is an option. Um, as an example, I'm not sure if any of you read, but it's, a, it, it's an excellent book to read, Ed Hussein's book, The Islamist, in, in which he talks about his own radicalization in, in, and then de-radicalization in Great Britain and he mentions Bosnia specifically as one of the triggers for that radi radicalization. Also, um, um, just to give you a theoretical background, um, Mizirov's transformative learning theory is the theory that talks about these moments in our lives that really are critical in triggering our self-reflection and how we construct who we are as an individual. For instance, I didn't want to necessarily before the war be an educator. I never thought that I would be talking about genocide um, as part of my entire professional experience. But this moment um, impacted me in the way that it reshaped, deconstructed who I was as a person and led to creation of really a new, um, new sense of self. And so to me, um, irrespective of whether it is an experience of genocide, or if it's a uh, foreign policy issue, or some other, um, uh, or some other uh, uh, trigger, if you will, lack of um, employment. Um, in some cases, we know that that is an issue for for particularly young Muslims in in poor context. Whatever the issue is, a trigger. Uh, for one's transformation. The key in whether radicalization occurs is how the educational systems in those contexts actually decide to handle the young individual's grievances, traumas, frustrations with exclusion, hate, or marginalization. So what do I mean by that? Educational systems are, or schools, classrooms are places where we create frameworks of meaning. It is a place where we create sense of belonging or not belonging. It is a place where we create moral frameworks, where we create a sense of self in relation to society. So it is critical that we create a form of inclusion and a place where grievances of someone like me, for instance, genocide survivor, can be expressed and discussed 
and addressed in the educational system. Um, if that doesn't happen, my view is that um, educational disengagement or displacement occurs. And that really creates, that's the first step that creates opportune moment for radicalization um, of whether we're talking about young Muslims or other groups. When disengagement from educational mainstream happens, some kids will drop out from school. Some kids will simply be silenced or feel excluded. Often when we hear stories of young individuals radicalizing around the world, um, we'll also hear the stories that we didn't know they radicalized. We didn't know they were silent, they were quiet in the classroom. Often that happens because there's this sense that we can't discuss some of these grievances. Islamophobia is not being discussed, for instance, openly in the classroom in the Western context. In fact, if one talks about Islam, they may be perceived and labeled immediately as potentially radicalizing. And so if we do not provide those um, spaces, safe spaces for conversation in education, what happens, young people seek replacement. They seek replacement in terms of social and educational um, uh, content. We see that particularly with social media, uh, where if grievances are not addressed in the formal educational system, they're addressed in some other venue outside of it. Um, and what we do know is that if young people are drawn to narratives that undermine conformity and promote deviant behavior, that can certainly help uh, help uh, lead them towards criminal e and extremist behavior. So in essence, when we fail to provide educational space and content that addresses the grievances for at-risk populations, for those who are uh, marginalized, the alternative social educational content undermining the mainstream narrative is likely to fill the void. So in essence, from my perspective, radicalization really begins when educational displacement in schools begins. Um, in order for radicalization to occur, what is critical is this idea of grievances. And that is something that I had mentioned through the example that I shared with you in terms of my own experience of surviving genocide, but it, it is an issue that is brought, brought up repeatedly by individuals who radicalize, who for instance, they themselves may have personal grievances like Ed Hussein is an example that I often use. Um, who, who is British born, Pakistani background, was bullied and excluded in school, didn't feel accepted. And then he began to actually associate, associate himself with other groups more broadly of Muslims who have been marginalized, developing his grievances and ultimately um, becoming more radical. Another key step in the radicalization process um, that I had found often is that these young individuals find what they call mentors or, or, or friends who become a source of refuge and offer educational replacement, if you will. And often those relationships are very important to young individuals because they provide a sense of personal touch and one-on-one -on -one relationships that don't exist in classroom environments. For instance, I'll give you an example of what happened in Bosnia after the war. Um, in Bosnia, we, before the war, we did not have Salafism. Um, Salafism was non-existent. It emerged in Bosnia as a result of the really genocide and the lack of, um, uh, lack of resources um, from the Western world to address the problems um, that continue to exist to, till today in, uh, in my uh, uh, homeland. So Salafis, offered what the West and what the mainstream educational system didn't offer. They offered continuing informal alternative and non-conforming education. They set up these mentorship clinics. They um, started to give lectures. They started to engage one-on-one -on -one with marginalized communities. And in fact, Salafism has been um, steadily um, on the rise in Bosnia today. How did they do it? They did it in person, but they also have leveraged internet. Internet has become the source where many podcasts, many influencers who radicalize um, actually help these young people isolate into these self-isolating clusters. Again, we've seen exact same pattern in the context of the United States with the rise of white supremacy. 
Uh, we know that Twitter alone accounts for about 40% of all extremist traffic online. And so in this process of radicalization, another factor that I had found, particularly within Bosnia um, and those Muslims that I had interviewed um, who have radicalized is this process of complete religious identity transformation. Um, just to give you one example, um, a young boy um, whose name is Ibro, uh, grew up in a small village in Bosnia, close to my hometown of Bihać. He was in his village a role model uh, for others in terms of being an excellent student. He helped uh, local mosque. Local mosque was even collecting money to finance his further education. He wanted to study religion. And then he encountered uh, one of uh, prominent Salafi uh, leaders and influencers who has been known and has been in prison for radicalizing uh, young Bosnians. Um, at, his name is Hussein Bilal Bosnich. And Ibra, under his influence, entirely transformed. He started to leave mosque early from prayers. He told local imam, you don't have a clue about Islam. He called his father an infidel. When you are dead, I won't pray for you because you are an infidel. Um, this is a photo of Hussein Bilal Bosnich, who was arrested um, in Bosnia for radicalizing young uh, Muslims. Um, Eber's example is a powerful example uh, of many young people who, um, who go through this process of transformation that often shocks their community. For instance, um, those who, who live in, in, in his village often said that it seemed that this mentor um, or a radicalizing recruiter had this magic power over Ibro that Ibro entirely self-isolated from his other relationships. And in fact, Ibro's father um, during a trial um, for Hussein Bilal Bosnich um, said the following, Ibro got to know Bosnich and moved in with him um, uh, in a short time, short time later in summer of 2014, he received military training and then he was gone to Syria. To a certain extent, he was sold. Um, and this has happened to quite a few young people, not only in Bosnia, but beyond Bosnia. And one of the key successes to the radicalization uh, process has been this idea of being able of maintaining exclusive relationship and dominant relationships. In other words, isolating the family and friends and isolating these young individuals from other conversations. Bosnian Salafis have realized that many um, young people who are unemployed, who are uh, perhaps depressed because of what had happened in Bosnia and their families as a result of genocide, that they didn't have within the mainstream educational system or within um, after school programs, that they didn't have opportunities for someone to one-on-one -on -one care for their grievances and for how they felt marginalized as a result of who they are. And so as a, as a result of that, Salafis really leveraged, um, at least those who are radicalizing young, young individuals, leveraged that um, environment and provided these spaces that today radicalize young Muslims. Next, and important factors, I think, in radicalizing youths, um, particularly in the Bosnian context, but I think this becomes relevant um, to other radicalization models, is the sense that these young people start for the first time, once they radicalize, to feel that they're part of the elite. They were never part of the elite. They often feel that they were excluded, they were not heard, they couldn't address their grievances. But in all of my conversations with those who radicalized in Bosnia, their sense of self changes to feeling special once they do radicalize, that they are the ones who are the only true Muslims, who um, are the only who actually follow Islam in Bosnia. For them, I am as a moderate Muslim, um, I am an infidel as much as anybody else. And so this sense of Elitism and being special is something that these individuals never find in the mainstream, but find in the radicalization process. And what becomes another essential step in the process and sort of graduating along, um, along that uh, radicalization pyramid is that um, they, get, they come to a point where no longer they care about being marginalized in the society. And they in fact deliberately exclude 
and deliberately marginalized from the rest of the mainstream. We see that in Bosnia with some communities of Salafis that don't have interactions and do not welcome anyone from the outside world. And um, to, to engage in conversations with them becomes much, much uh, more difficult. For instance, for me, um, it took several years to access these communities and conduct interviews with the individuals who have radicalized. And once we have that self-marginalization, um, process of radicalization is really, in, in my view, achieved, and it becomes much more uh, difficult to really de-radicalize them. And my view is that the real opportunity to prevent radicalization is to give examples of stories like the cat I never named, where I, as a genocide survivor, not only survive and manage to find my own inner resilience, but actually engage in education and other alternative pathways to address grievances or issues uh, that one may have. And this is just a sum of the model that, um, that um, I am actually working on. It's going to be published in an upcoming scholarly, uh, scholarly paper that really sums up the process I had just shared with you. So going from educational displacement, disengagement, um, uh, feeling aggrieved in the society because of marginalization and then seeking for men seeking mentor refuge that then deepens this separation from the mainstream and where mentors when they happen to be uh, radicalizing uh, uh, groups uh, recruiters or extremists they tend to curate content whether online or in person to deepen that religious identity transformation that often leads to further marginalized um, and, and really self-perpetuated exclusion from the society that enables radicalization full, to be fully achieved. Um, this, these are just some of the suggested readings um, that I share that share some of my perspectives on radicalization that you can also find on my website. Um, and, um, and again, um, I would like to at this point to really engage in conversation and, and various questions, but if you have questions about um, either my book or any of my work, the best way to find me is to, to reach out on Twitter or Facebook, and you can also take a look at my website, sabikilreyes.org, where much of my work and much, much of my ideas are, um, are present. Um, just to share before, before I end sharing my screen with you that the cat I never named has been recognized in the United States as incredibly uh, powerful tool to counter Islamophobia and um, to inspire resilience in young people. Um, it has received extraordinary um, reviews from the literary community. It has won a finalist medal as one of top five nonfiction book in the United States for young adults. Um, so in many ways, um, it has filled a vacuum that I think has exist in terms of Muslim wo voices in the literature, particularly nonfiction um, in the United States.